Good afternoon, everyone. A warm welcome to our highly anticipated webinar on the process of lime slurry production. I'm Amin Thorn, your host for today's event, and we are delighted to have you join us today as we continue our series of webinars on lime processing. Lime is a cornerstone of countless applications, has long been a catalyst for innovation and progress. From construction to environmental solutions, its versatile role shapes the modern world. As we gather here with diverse backgrounds and experiences, we find common ground in our pursuit of knowledge. And whether you're joining us from South Africa or anywhere else in the world, we hope that you find today's webinar insightful. Our moderator today is Prince Kangale, an experienced mechanical engineer and senior project manager. Prince recently completed a project involving the supply of limestone and lime slate implants for a gold mine in Saudi Arabia. Our guest speakers today are Simon Wilmot and Carsten Wardrich. Simon Wilmot is the founder and director of Hydrolime. Simon has a strong technical background with degrees in chemistry, metallurgy, and business administration, and has been involved in the lime industry for the past 28 years. Simon will be sharing his insights on the important quality considerations of lime. Carsten Woodrich is an engineer with over 25 years of experience and has designed over 35 lime plants. Carsten will be discussing factors affecting slaking and the prevention of limestone buildup. Together, these speakers bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to our webinar. And attendees can expect to leave with valuable insight into the lime slurry production process and how to apply this knowledge to the benefit of your processes and applications. To schedule a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one of the speakers after the event, you can use the link provided in the chat. Throughout this session, we encourage you to actively engage by using the chat function to post your questions to our guest speakers. Please keep your microphones muted and only send your questions by using the chat in the meeting. In this dynamic and interactive environment, let's forge ahead, united in our pursuit of excellence in lime slurry production. Welcome to the lime slurry production webinar, a platform where curiosity meets expertise. So without further ado, Prince, I'll hand over to you. Amin, thank you very much. And Kastin and Simon, welcome. And thank you, gentlemen, for willing to share your expertise with us and all the audience in this uh, in this web webinar. So I think like, yeah, I mean, uh, if we talk about line, that's one area throughout my working life. If, I, if I'm involved with a line processing project, I think that's where my passion lies. And, uh, you know, it's one subject that we can talk for days and days and days and days, but obviously time is limited. I think without wasting any more time, I think we can just kick off with our with our discussion. And um, so maybe like Simon, we're talking about lime. I mean, uh, so what are the different methods of producing lime slurry? Okay, sure, Prince. Um, just remember, of course, uh, the lime slurry we're talking about here is a suspension of calcium hydroxide in water, and and that is simply produced either by uh, slaking unslaked lime calcium oxide uh, with water and in a in a controlled environment to produce that suspension of calcium hydroxide in water, and the other method is is uh, is simply to take uh, pre prepared hyd hydrated lime calcium hydroxide in powder form and slurrying it in water. And, and the methods uh, would be dependent on uh, customer requirements. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Simon. And then, uh, so when does the client use unslaked and, uh, and slaked lime? I mean... Uh... Yeah, look, the, the primarily uh, small users of, of lime slurries would probably use a, uh, a slurry of, of hydrated lime. And uh, the bigger users would would have their own slaker and use unslaked lime. And remember that um, the, the, your cost per ton of available lime increases 
from using unslaked lime towards hydrated lime because um, and that's due to really sort of cost considerations now um, using unslaked lime and slaking it you're using a lime calcium oxide contains typically 89 percent available lime and you're mixing that with water so every ton of unslaked lime you you're buying um, it, you can it contains um, 89 percent uh, available lime compare that to hydrated lime where the supplier of your hydrated lime has already added water to it added 24 percent water in fact stoichiometrically and uh, so that ton of hydrated lime contains stoichiometrically 67% available lime. So for every ton of that of hydrated lime you buy, you get sort of 67% of good stuff versus your 89% uh, typically of, of an unslaked lime. So there's a cost consideration of that. Uh, the bulk density of, of hydrated lime is, is less, especially aerated if it's transported in a tanker. And these considerations have to be be considered when when setting up a plant uh, to use to use one or the other and um, we have our own model which we use with customers to assess the viability of one over the other okay great simon thanks just to uh, let everyone know there's a uh, i see there's a question there on the site probably maybe pops up on everyone's screen if you can just take your time and uh and answer that question i think some even if you're not sure at the moment, I think some of the answers might develop as we go as we proceed with the with the discussion. You know, so uh, someone from what you're saying now, it looks like they are there might be some challenges in terms of uh, the slaking processes. And so, if maybe we can just touch base on that, what are the some what are the factors which affect uh, 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 the slaking processes? Maybe Kirsten, you can kick off with that. Yeah, thank you, Prince. Can maybe, yeah. Yeah, so what we really, there's a few factors then, and, and Simon will elaborate on, on one or two of them as well. I think for, for the slaking process, which is ex effectively uh, the process of converting calcium oxide to the slurry itself is an exothermic process, uh, and adding water to it basically gets the chemical reaction going. So one of the factors is obviously the water quality uh, on any lime slaking plant. Uh, and there's certain chemicals that in the water that either reduce the reaction or increase the reaction. And, and one of them is, for instance, sulfates. So if you have a, a water that has a lot of sulfates in it, uh, process water, you actually could reduce the actual reactivity of that, of that reaction in the end. Um, and, and what basically happens, the sulfates prevent the, the lime from actually uh, um, slaking. Uh, and ultimately, if you use that type of water, um, you end up actually using more lime in the end because some of that lime becomes unavailable to the process. So that's one of the big factors there. Uh, and generally, when we do a plant design, for instance, one of the things we would do beforehand is to actually check the water quality to see what the uh, constituents of that water are. Uh, and we've had cases where it's unsuitable for slaking and you then have to go to uh, a, a municipal water or potable water to do the slaking process. And ultimately, the customer really needs to have a look at, does he either want to use cheaper process water, which has potentially has sulfates in it, uh, and use more lime? So the cost would basically be shifted to the lime side. Or does he want to treat the water, get rid of the sulfates, add the cost factor to the actual processing of the water, and then use less lime on the other side? And it, it's really a balancing act in the end to see you know, what's, what's the best way to go if you don't have a choice uh, of having both available in terms of the water quality. Um, I think one of the other ones is obviously temperature. So the lime slaking process being exothermic, um, if uh, it, we generally sort of slake at 76 degrees, which is a, a reasonable uh, temperature for a 20% uh, slurry concentration. Um, if you, for instance, slake at lower temperatures, which would mean typically if you if you dilute it. So if you're only slaking at a 10% concentration, for instance, your exothermic reaction would not give you enough uh, energy to actually get the temperature of the water up to the 76 degrees. What we do find is that potentially the, um, the actual powder doesn't wet properly in the colder conditions, uh, and you don't have that reaction happening. And we have seen in some of the flat bottom slakers where 
that powder actually gets encapsulated with a with a limestone coating on the outside, and you you create little balls that start rolling around in the bottom of the slaker at lower temperatures. Um, the other side is obviously if you if you add too much lime to the process and you actually get the temperatures up. Um, here in Johannesburg, for instance, water starts boiling between 97 and, and 98 degrees Celsius. So you don't want to really push that process up to a point where you actually start boiling that, that liquid, that slurry in the actual slaker. So those are the two sort of considerations there. Um, Simon, I think from a, from a reactivity point of view, I think you, you could give us some insight on that potentially. Yeah, um, I've just jotted down um, four extra additional points. Um, yeah, you touched on the reactivity. Clearly, uh, the factor, factors affecting slaking, um, the quality of the lime and uh, reactivity being one chemical measure that we use. It's basically, it's, a, it's measured in as an Arden, uh, I'm not going to go into the detail, but it's, it's basically a measure of how readily your, your lime reacts with, with water. And uh, that's, that's a function of the burning of the limestone to produce, produce the lime. So, um, and that's one of the tests that one, one should be, uh, should be consider when, when looking at uh, uh, slaking, uh, uh, factors affecting slaking. Another quality, of course, is the available lime that you have in, in, in your calcium oxide, the lime that you're buying from your supplier. Um, another consideration, a factor, is the grit content of, of that lime. It, it relates somewhat to, to, of course, to the amount of available lime you have. The more grit, which is typically acid insolubles, things like silica or unburnt limestone in your lime, those all contribute to the grit. And the more you have of that, of course, the less available lime to react with water you will have. Um, a third point is the fineness of your lime. That's, that definitely affects the, the slaking uh, characteristics. Um, the finer, the better. And that's intuitive that your, your particle of calcium oxide that is reacting with water uh, will, will react. You've got a much bigger surface area, the, the finer the product. So um, your fine lime, you can, you can slake lime of, of, of any size, you know, 50 millimeter stones or burnt, uh, limestone of 50 millimeters calcine will give you a 50 millimeter lump of calcium oxide that can be slaked but of course you you need to the, the surface the surface uh, uh, particles of calcium oxide will react first to form calcium hydroxide and it will slowly work its way through and then um, the a problem there you have to consider is uh, just what um, uh, Karsten has alluded to the concept of drowning where you, where you have too much water to that lime and it forms a hydrate coating and the inside of your lime doesn't react properly. So um, in those cases, yeah, well, you have to guard against it uh, if you don't want to get special equipment to, to prevent that. Um, uh, another point um, uh, to, uh, that affects staking is obviously the agitation. You, you, want, a, you want a solid a good agitation as you're adding the unslaked lime to the water in your first stage you must have a good agitation and um, I think uh, Carsten will talk a bit more about that later but that's another factor that's um, that affects slaking. Prince? Yeah Simon thank you very much and Carsten thanks to you as well for this detailed explanation. I think it's one of the items that I'm very much fascinated about from my uh, from my side. I just recall a few years back, we did one of the projects somewhere here in, uh, in Kauteng and uh, we commissioned the plant, I think it was during summer. And then we're, I mean, the slaking temperature was... 17 of 72 to 76 degrees C. And everyone was happy. And come winter, then I got a call from the client and say, what's happening here? I think on that day, we're just above the freezing point. It was... Full day? And what's happening? Like... Uh, you were saying it's getting about just above 50 degrees C. It's not up. It's not achieving 76 degree uh, Celsius anymore. And uh, but I think there was no parameters change in terms of how much lime is putting in and, and how much water is putting in. And before we eventually make our way there, we thought like maybe the solution would be just to put more lime uh, with the hope that the temperature will increase. And then, uh, maybe you can just 
uh, from your previous explanation, you were talking about temperature. Can you just touch on that and maybe you can share some light as what was the what was actually happening with when that scenario happened? Yeah, very, very valid point there. Um, I mean, effectively, when you add a, a certain amount of lime to a, a certain volume of water at, at a constant ratio, your increase in temperature will only be finite. So, for instance, you know, if you do a 20% slurry concentration, the increase in temperature will generally be about 50 degrees Celsius. So obviously, if you start with 25 degrees water temperature going into this laker, you add 50 to it, you get to around about 75 degrees. On a very cold day, as Prince explained already, you start with zero degrees and you add 50 degrees to that, and you end up at 50 degrees in the end. So it's not really a, a, a problem in terms of the process when you see those uh, sort of problems. The, what one really then could, for instance, do is to increase the actual water temperature going into this lake itself. And in some countries where you have you know, sub-zero temperatures, for instance, that, that is a, a, a common thing to do, where you either electrically or preheat the water or with the gas. Um, and there's another way of doing it is that you actually run that water line around the slaker itself with the heat exchanger, because obviously your slaker will run at a, at a higher temperature and you, and you literally preheat the water before it goes into the slaker itself. Um, and again, one would have to have a look at that very carefully. It, it may not be a major risk, sort of everything above about 65 degrees should be okay. Um, but once you go below that, obviously, as I alluded to earlier, you could have the risk of, of some of that lime literally producing those little limestone balls at the bottom of the slaker. So we really have to have a look when we design a plant like that, the atmosphere or the ambient conditions around the, the whole plant. So one really needs to have a look at the bigger picture, look at the incoming water temperatures, the atmospheric sort of conditions around the lime plant, that all goes into the final design of, of that plant itself. So it's, it's pretty important to have a look at all those factors uh, um, when, when you actually design a plant like that. Thanks, Prince. Uh, thank you very much for uh, clearing that part. So I think, I'm not sure if it was you, or I think it was more uh, Simon earlier on working about unslaked lime, slaked lime. So maybe we can just touch base on the, on the uh, cost impact in terms of deciding on which lime to use in terms of all the yeah. uh, infrastructure or the processing equipment that you need to put in place to be uh, to be able to process whether uh, on slag lime or slag lime i mean what we what could there must be some sort of cost impact towards that decision maybe what can you uh, offer to your cousin what can you tell us about that yeah, I think um, you know it really depends on the lime quality, and and uh, as Simon said already, you could either use hydrated lime or unslaked lime in terms of the process. Um, the most or well, cheapest from an equipment point of view, uh, if we just look at the plant itself, would typically be the hydrated lime plant. Um, if you're using fine uh, product, and uh, that would also be with the calcium oxide. If you're using unslaked lime, the fine material, obviously, you don't need things like grit removal systems. You don't need big agitators to actually um, suspend larger particles and that sort of thing. So uh, that, that would be from a, from a cost factor, just from a, a slaking plant point of view. Once you go to a more coarser grit, obviously, as, as Simon alluded earlier, you have the possibility of having solid grit particles in that, in that uh, slurry. Uh, pumps don't really like those particles when they go through the pumps. Uh, uh, there's the wear issue and damage to the liners and that. So then you start adding things like, uh, you know, grit removal screw. And then obviously when you go to the real big particles and in some countries, the, you know, the final lime is not available. You actually get the burnt lime in its raw form, which is effectively 50 millimeter lumps. Um, you could go to something like a, a ball mill slaking process. And, and just from a cost point of view, the ball mill slaking process is roughly 10 times more expensive from a capital expenditure point of view than than a normal uh, attrition slake or a slaking process. The second thing you really need to have a look at as well uh, is between hydrated lime and unslaked lime, as Simon explained a bit earlier, the bulk density is totally different. So most of the feed equipment is volumetric feed equipment. So if you have a hydrated lime plant, uh, mixing plant, you would typically need bigger equipment, feed equipment, and we're talking rotary feeders and screw conveyors than you would when you use an unslaked plant. So slight difference there, um, but I think that the big, real big factor comes in when you're looking at the slaking plants themselves and the actual quality of the lime in terms of the fineness of the lime. That's where the 
the cost uh, increases as the lime becomes coarser. So I think here in South Africa, uh, most of the lime sold here is a, is a very finely milled lime. And then obviously you need just the basic mixing tank, uh, no need for grit screw removal or attrition slackers or ball mills either around it. So that, that becomes the most cost effective way from a capital expenditure point of view. So I think those are the sort of factors that, that one would typically look at uh, in that case. Yeah, I'll like to, I think with everything in life, and, uh, safety becomes a very important aspect of it. So in terms of the safety risk consideration between uh, slake, slake lime and uh, slake lime, what can you guys tell us, Simon, I think you can, uh, you can comment on that. Sure, um, safety around, around lime. Uh, firstly, unslaked lime, um, calcium oxide. It it reacts as as we know. It's 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 uh, it's really keen to get back to its original form of calcium carbonate. We've spent a lot of time and effort to rip that CO two off to, and it doesn't like that. So it reacts readily with water. So the the and uh, and the formation of uh, uh, calcium hydroxide it's just it's just um, firstly a strong alka alkali that's one of the the major benefits of lime and one of its primary uses but that strong strong alkali typically in, in processes 12 to ph 12 to 14 um, can result in in chemical burns so um, one one has to bear that in mind and when when one talks of of the actual slaking process itself that is strongly exothermic um, Carsten's already mentioned, you know, this, you, you boil, uh, water boils with, uh, with this. So you're going to, you have the, the risk of thermal burns. Now, um, in, in the general application and handling of that, one has to be therefore very careful with the operators, making sure that, that you exclude lime dust from any bodily moisture. That's sort of mucous membranes, sweat. You know, um, if you're working with it, um, you know, any any sweat, lime dust, calcium oxide will react, forming and have that exothermic reaction. So it'll be it'll be hot and it'll be chemically uh, undesirable on your on your skin. So you just make sure that your operators clearly it must be well, well ventilated. Uh, they must have eye protection, very, very clearly dust masks, protect them there. You know, long sleeve overalls and 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 the like. Um, so it's you want to the big things you want to avoid is 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 lime in your eyes. That that's that's the that's probably the worst worst one. Uh, one of um, our operators had a had an issue. He got splashed with milk of lime in his eyes, and it's it's not a pleasant uh, uh, experience. So, um, but apart from those things, if you just take uh, you know general good care it's those those should be manageable um and the other thing just to mention it's it's not a carcinogen so there's no there's no cancer risk not like silicosis or anything like that lime dust is dust is not a carcinogen or calcium hydro, uh, hydroxide yeah thank you very much Simon. yeah thank you for that explanation so yeah on the poll i uh, see at least everyone most of people are participating i've seen the the um the answers to the question which is posed on the poll, it's yeah, there's all sort of uh, interesting answers. I think some of the, I don't know if there's a way of maybe still reaching to people that we can just take some of the discussion further just based on the answers that we see here. Yeah? Uh, I like also just to mention to our audience and say, look, I mean, I think it was a great idea and a good decision for you guys to decide to participate on this, uh, on this webinar. So let me just back to uh, what we're discussing. Cousin, like uh, on Simon, uh, through my working life, I mean, uh, uh, we've installed and commissioned lime slaking plants basically all over. I mean, some of the plants which we installed probably maybe over five years back, you go there today, it looks like it's just been installed last month or it hasn't started working. They're very neat. You go to some, some of the... Uh, Plants, then you find that there's a bit of build up everywhere, and um, and so I'm just trying to give that background, bringing to my question that I want to pose to um, to you guys. I mean, uh, maybe I'll pose it to Kirsten. Well, what causes lime build up? 
Yeah, the lime buildup is is effectively the chemical reaction of that uh, hydrated lime wanting to go back to its natural state again, uh, and it, it it actually reacts with carbon dioxide in the air. Now you'll realize we've got 0.04% roughly of, of carbon dioxide in atmospheric air. And any contact with hydrated lime powder itself at, at room temperature, and then obviously the slurry as well, it reacts with that carbon dioxide and it reverts back to its original state, which is limestone. And in that reaction process, it also liberates water at the same time. So effectively you've got sticky lime particles or limestone particles that literally stick to everything. So, um, I mean, typically if you have a, a lime plant where you have hydrated lime dust in the air and it settles on cars, you typically find a, a sort of rough surface on the surface of the, of the vehicle. And that is not just because the stuff stuck to the, to the actual, uh, that the powder is stuck to the, to the actual surface. It's actually that chemical reaction with the carbon dioxide, liberating water and then becomes limestone. And the only real way to get rid of that is, is to use a slightly acidic uh, um, liquid to actually get that to react with the limestone. And typically for cleaning items on, on lime plants that you could use something like vinegar um, to clean. We're talking typically flow meters and that where you want to see what the display is showing and it's covered in, in that light limestone buildup over it that you can't really see it in the end. Uh, from a from a piping point of view, um, obviously you want to make sure that you don't get that build up inside the pipes because that would typically reduce your diameters and ultimately render that pipeline useless. So typically, there's also carbon dioxide, uh, you know, dissolved in water, and and I think uh, Simon will give us a bit more detail on on another mechanism that that happens there. But what you really want to do in the in the transfer pipelines and that is firstly make sure that you don't stop the plant. Uh, with the slurry still in the pipes. So generally we would recommend something like an automatic flushing system, both on shutdown where you effectively make sure that the slurry is if, um, taken out of the pipeline into your holding tank and you're left with just pure water in the lines. Firstly, it settles out and then obviously while it's settled and sitting in the bottom of the pipeline, it reacts with that with the dissolved carbon dioxide and it makes a you know, micron layer on micron layer on the inside of the pipes in terms of the, the limestone buildup. Um, and, and what you would typically do on ring mains is use you know, HDPE piping because that's slightly flexible. So if there is any buildup on the inside, it actually, during the flexing while the, the pump pressures change, um, you actually break that very light and, and very thin layer of limestone off and, and transfer it down the line into your process. Um, Simon, I think there's there's another mechanism that that you sort of explained last time in terms of uh, yeah, that causes the, that build up as well. Yeah, just a, another aggravating factor is is um, water hardness. So any any um, carbonate hardness in your slaking or dilution water uh, will precipitate out as calcium carbonate or limestone during in the process. So if if you are using hard water. Um, it's sometimes uh, unavoidable to, but to use that hard water, but it would aggravate the the the, the um, um, precipitation of calcium carbonate on the um, uh, on your equipment. And uh, I just want to just you just raised a point talking about um, uh, your PVC pipes and things like that. In in um, some of the, uh, the slakers that we operated for a customer. Um, uh, my, my partner, he he lined the 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 first three, well the three stages of our slaker with a sort of rubberized coating. You know, like here in South Africa, we get them in the back of pickups. You know that they and and that pr proved very successful to prevent any. Um, you could just wash it off during a sort of a clean out. It wasn't bare metal where you had a hard substrate and the, the reagent coming onto it. So that that worked very well to prevent. Uh, scaling on in, inside the uh, slaking uh, system. Thank you, Simon. I think just to summarize what you two gentlemen who were saying, I think it's also important just to understand the chemistry behind it. It's not just about putting all that mixing with water and saying you're creating a bulk of lime. And I think the chemistry behind it in terms of uh, what customer you were explaining earlier with all the reaction and exposing it to CO2 and uh, which can create a bulk up, I think it's 
it's a key factor to to know the chemistry behind the um, the processing of lime. And, uh, I don't know if you have, if you guys agree with that, but I'm not going to give opportunity to say yes or no. <laughs> so we can just maybe move on. So anyway, still on lime. What are the important quality consideration uh, checks for lime milk of lime? What can you guys tell us? I think maybe Captain, you can kick off on that one. I think Simon, you're most probably the better person to answer that in terms of the, the yeah. milk of lime quality. Okay. Yeah. So um, quality for uh, considerations for uh, the lime you're using uh, for milk of lime and, and the milk of lime, it's, it's, they're, they're not complicated. Um, you should obviously have a specification uh, from, your, from your supplier of if it's unslaked lime, you certainly want to know what, what the available lime uh, percentages in in the lime. Uh, typically, you know, again here in South Africa, uh, a minimum available lime spec would typically be eighty five percent. That's a minimum spec, and one would expect uh, you know ongoing process uh, being about eighty nine percent. That's sort of kind of the, the the spec you would uh, you. So that's a quality check you you would have on your on your incoming lime i mentioned before that reactivity the, the how readily that incoming lime reacts with water in your slaking process if you are using unslaked lime um, but um, reactivity uh, is not is not often used as a as a quality determine determinant in slaking processes a reactivity we we we, we have customers in the um, steel and alloy industry, used as a, where lime is used as a, a slag conditioner, and that's where reactivity is important for for that. But it does have its place in, um, as I explained, it's the it's the it's determined by its ability of lime to react with water. But uh, so, if your quality consideration to your supplier of of unslaked lime for slaking is available lime and percentage grit, I would think. You would need to, as, and again, I mentioned it previously, the more grit you have, it takes the place of available lime. So available lime is the key uh, quality determinant uh, uh, that you must specify. Um, fineness of the lime, obviously, is, uh, is, is what you say. You want a fine unslaked lime, 80% minus 45 micron, or whatever the spec is, because that, that will, that will determine the consistency of the product of the feed going into your slaker. And um, Carsten's already mentioned that water temperature can change change things in your slaker. You don't want to have more variables based on the feed lime coming in, i.e. your availables or percentage of grit that var varies and things like that. Moving on to the, the milk of lime, um, the milk of lime, you know, as I mentioned, it's a it's a suspension, and and it's typically mentioned uh, uh, measured as a percentage solids in your milk of lime. So you want a twenty percent lime slurry, for example, um, and that is that is easily measured uh, in the lime plants we've 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 run. Um, you know, you have a a, a mossy density density scale next to the slakers, and the operator periodically just takes out a fills a little one liter bucket and, and reads the, the the slurry density of of the scale and that's that's a very useful tool just as a sort of online um, you know uh, a measure of what goes on so it's it measures the, the, the slurry density um, of that and that typically depending on your process and um, your the length of your ring mains and all sorts of other good things a, a 20 percent lime, uh, slurry density is a, is a good number to work on. Uh, you know, 10%, you know, you're just pumping much more water around and anything much more than about 24%, 25%, things start getting a little bit syrupy and things like that. And that's where Carsten will have problems with all with the kit that he provides where these things start blocking up and uh, and the like. Thanks, Simon. Thank you very much. And then... Uh... Uh, you've mentioned about lime availability. So obviously, whatever quantity you put, whatever it's in there, it's not 100% of what you require. So we're talking about 94%, 95% there in terms of what, or 
Merchant 94 96% in terms of line of availability. So it means there are some, there are some impurities which you don't necessarily need or require for the for the process. And um, so at, at what point or how do you determine that in this case I do need a grid removal uh, 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 process or, or equipment? Uh, how do you go about determining that? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, just so grit um, as in in lime. So so you know when when you say I'm buying lime, uh, lime by chemical definition, as we know, is is calcium oxide. So you're not you're not when you buy a ton of lime from a supplier, it's it's in most cases uh, it's it's unlikely to be 100% calcium oxide. You know what we call lime, especially here in South Africa, we're not blessed with with great qualities of, of a metallurgical grade limestone. Um, our limestone as, as quarried here is typically about 96%, 97% uh, calcium carbonate. And the, the rest is, uh, you know, silica, a little bit of alumina, about 8.8% MN203, which gives our South African lime the sort of buff, buff color rather than the White Cliffs of Dover, uh, which limestone, pure limestone, is is is, is white. Um, but uh, so here we have uh, about a 0.6.8 percent MN203. So those those constituents, together with any unburnt limestone, because you start off with a with a lump of calcium carbonate, and uh, if that is in a rotary kiln, typically 50 millimeters, um, uh, the lime that results out of that after losing 40%, 44% of mass uh, by virtue of losing the CO2 out of it, um, that lime will, will contain the grit that I mentioned, the acid insolubles, the MN203s and things like that, plus a small core in the center of each lump that is unburnt calcium carbonate, and that that is also counted as grit. So typically, we have uh, four to six percent grit in in South African lime. And now moving to to the impact of that on slaking. Now, if if you if you're slaking big lumps of of lime, you, you can expect to if if you if you're slaking twenty millimeters pieces of lime. You can expect to have 20 millimeter pieces of silica or, or other pieces uh, of, of grit. Of course, if, you, if you're using a ground lime, uh, something like a, 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 a ground unslaked lime, typically minus 2.35 millimeters, or a uh, fine unslaked lime, as we call it in our South African industry, uh, we produce a minus 45 micron uh, fine unslaked lime. Now, the, the grit is, is, is obviously just ground up to that size. So, um, and I think, Karsten, you, you also mentioned it, you alluded to this earlier. You know, if, if, you, if you, you're slaking big particles, you'll have big particles of grit. So you, 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 don't, you don't want those things in your, in your system. If you're using extremely fine lime, lime to slake, the minus 45 micron that those impurities will will stay in suspension and and you won't need that uh, um, uh, reticulation to take take the grit out so the long answer to to prince's question what determines you know the sort of grit and i think it's it's the percentage of grit in your unslaked lime coming in and remember that is something that you would have de determined with your supplier uh, and how well he burns his lime and, and the, the quality of the limestone that he uses to burn. Um, and secondly, the, the, the fineness of that lime, because you can, you can get rid of, you can get round a host of evils by milling the stuff extremely fine before you slake it. Simon, thank you very much. I think that's now I'd like you to add on this, but before I give you the opportunity, is uh... I just want to, I think what's important to our light from my side is uh, we've discussed in terms of um, just the reactivity of lime. I mean, um, what are the important factors? I mean, so if I can just summarize based on what I've gathered from this discussion, 
good quality water. I mean, you've got a good quality line. And in terms of the, the, I think the other key challenges, um, also what I'm seeing on the polls here, the line build up. I think it's maybe a good selection of the equipment, making sure that they, they keep the line moving. I think from what, I mean, if you just dump lime on the water on the tank and leave it there without any agitation, it's bound to settle, then you're going to end up with, uh, with problems. I think keeping it moving, moving at the right speed, I think those are the uh, those are the key factors. So I just wanted to alight on that part before Kasna give you opportunity to 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 add on what uh, Simon was saying earlier related to the the grid. Yeah, I think yeah, you know, if we look at in terms of what equipment you need to remove the grit in the end, uh, ideally, as Simon said, you use the very fine lime. You don't worry about grit. Uh, you let the process take care of that downstream uh, in settling tanks or wherever it's going. Um, but if you do need sort of grit removal, the the one thing that we have seen in the past is the uh, you know the use of screens to try and screen out the grit. Now, if you think about the chemistry, what do you do when you actually pour lime slurry over a screen? You effectively expose that screen surface area to atmospheric air. Uh, and we have found in, in, in the past where these screens literally block up within two or three days. And it's purely because of the limestone buildup, that reaction with carbon dioxide. So from our point of view, screens are, are something we would typically not use to actually try and get the grit out of uh, a lime slurry. Um, instead, we, we tend to use uh, lime or grit screws. So we, when we have an agitator, and we typically use uh, the, the sort of higher power agitation where you actually start suspending those particles, of, you know, two to four millimeters or so in the actual slurry, and you allow them to run over into a second, what we call almost a settling tank uh, that is fitted with an inclined grit screw. And you allow those solid particles, uh, and really depends on the speed of the of the actual slurry running through that tank. You allow the bigger particles to settle out, and the screw that's then fitted to the bottom of that settling tank literally comes out at an angle, and slowly but surely moves that grit up and out of the actual settling tank into a, a skip um, that you would typically be able to do in that way. Uh, and those those work very successfully. They can be used as bolt-on um, items to Round tanks, square tanks, uh, you know, it really depends on, on, the, on the configuration and the requirements in the end. But typically, we, we'd recommend something like that, not, not to uh, screen. Um, and just we pointed on that, or we alluded to the point of the carbon dioxide there, is obviously the agitation is also very important in terms of the process. So there's a, there's a fine line before, you know, in terms of trying to suspend these solid particles, you need quite a bit of vigorous agitation. But the last thing you really want to do is draw carbon dioxide or air into the actual process, which, which does happen when you start agitating at, at you know, very high speeds and, and vigorous agitation. So from a design point of view, you've got to be very careful that you don't do that because that immediately, again, uh, gives the carbon dioxide contact with your slurry. And in the end, you end up with a, with a slaking tank that has you know, got built up thick walls of, of limestone. And unfortunately, the only way to get rid of that is either acid, uh, you know, which, is, which is dangerous to do uh, from a safety point of view, or you take a jackhammer where you then have the risk of damaging equipment, you know, damaging agitator blades, the baffle plates in the actual slakers, and, and obviously the tank itself. So uh, uh, that's just, you know, on the grid side, that's, that's uh, yeah, our recommendations, use a grid screw and don't use any screens if you can. Carsten, yeah. maybe I can just, I can yeah. just add there, I remember, uh, we had a, a customer years ago, and he, he was complaining bitterly about um, he, grit, and he was using a, a, what we called a ground down slake lime minus 2.35, and so that forms grit as a sort of kind of sand, and uh, he was saying, ah, oh, the grit wasn't being removed and things like that, and, and uh, so anyway, we went to visit him, and he, he, had, uh, he had that said grit removal screw, but clearly, uh, and the point being, one must although it's, it's always the sort of um, poor stepdaughter of any plant, the lime plant, but you, it does need a little bit of attention and maintenance at occasionally. And we noticed the grit removal screw, which I think nominally was meant to be 300. It was probably at about 240 di diameter. It had just been worn away over the years. So this thing was turning, but not, not doing what it was meant to do. It had just been worn away by these fairly aggressive silica grit particles. So um, for grit removal, you must always, I think, make sense to make sure that your, 
your equipment is in the state that it should be in. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah, Simon, thank you very much on adding on that. I like the question from from these two expertise here in terms on this subject. <laughs> we can see it from the distance. So basically, yeah, just for the audience, they still there. Yeah. There's a question there on the side. What challenges have you faced in your lime production processes? I see uh, a good number of people are answering. In case you didn't see it, feel free to, to answer that. Maybe we'll just, I mean, some of the answers or some of the challenges that have been uh, mentioned throughout this uh, this discussion. So, Kasten, you were talking about aggressive agitation earlier on. So, just a coincidence, we've got a question from the audience. So, the question. So the question is, can we use air injection to agitate on the tanks? Yeah, very, very, very valid question. I mean, we've we've had it in the past where you go to a site and the agitator shaft breaks. Uh, normally happens during night shift, and the operators then have to find a way of agitating the lime. And the easiest way to do that is to put an air sparge into it. Use compressed air with a lance and you push that in and it bubbles through the actual slurry and, and creates good agitation in the end and the process can go on. The only problem is that three months down the line, you know, the agitator hasn't been repaired. The tank is actually one solid block of, of uh, calcium carbonate or, or limestone. And, and that is purely as a result of, of not you know, knowing the actual chemistry behind it. So it's very important also to, to look at the, or train the op operators accordingly, let them know what the, what happens with this certain chemistry around it? Because with air sparging, you have obviously injecting carbon dioxide, atmospheric carbon dioxide into the process as well. And that's the last thing you want. To do. You might be able to do it for a few hours, but definitely not recommended on the long term. Thank you very much, Kastin. Uh, I'm just going through the audience questions, questions now. So the other one here is, what control measures are used in, uh, in the slaking process? So I think, uh, if I can just add on that from my side, it's probably maybe to do with uh, earlier we were talking about uh, temperature, what should be maybe classified as a right slaking temperature. Maybe obviously you're mixing, it's to do with the ratios in terms of your uh, powder and water. So, so within within those parameters, what, what can you tell us about the control measures? Shall I, shall I grab that one, Simon? Yeah, uh, yeah effectively, I mean, there's, there's two ways of, of controlling a lime pond. The one is on temperature. Um, but one of the big things with temperature control is the fact that it takes time for uh, a you know lime particle or lime calcium carbonate particle to actually react with water, and you typically see you know sometimes eight minutes or something like that for the reaction to happen completely. So firstly, you have to have a look at the retention time in a slaker. How long do you need to keep that product in there for that reaction to happen completely? Uh, and then, and then the, the the other problem then is obviously you know with that uh, that time, um, you, you, sorry, the the sorry Prince, I've just you <laughs> got uh, sidetracked here. Um, so yeah, we're just obviously discussing about control measures in terms of the yeah the, the control yeah sorry the, so the, effectively what what happens then um, you have that time lag and and the big problem that you do. Um, have then is if you change something, it takes eight minutes for it to happen. And then, so if you, for instance, increase lime feed to increase temperature, you may actually overfeed by the time you actually see what the actual output uh, is in terms of temperature, and you could boil a, a slaker typically. So, generally, what we do on our side is we use a ratio control where you have a controlled uh, amount of water and a controlled amount of lime going together, and those, is, those you change. And you use the temperature purely for uh, just checking your actual uh, process in the end as a, as a uh, uh, check. So it, it means that you've got a much quicker reaction time in terms of the ratio control. Um, it's, it's almost immediate if you do change something there and you just use your temperature as a check in there. Thank you very much, uh, Kastin. So I wish we can carry on. Yeah, someone, someone will be with you now. I wish you can carry on for another hour in like, I said earlier, look, I'm very much fascinated about this <laughs> line processing. And um, someone like, um, if you want to add on what Katrin said, at the same time, if you can just maybe give us the, you can just maybe highlight the important factors that came from this discussion that you want 
our audience to walk away with above adding on what Kirsten was uh, was uh, was discussing earlier on. Please over to you, Simon. You can. Well, just as a sort of a, a conclusion, you say to about yeah, yeah, so factors saying, around making or yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is, you can just maybe add on what Kirsten was saying earlier regarding the control measures related to oh, the okay. selecting processes. Yeah, so just just that, just yeah. Yeah, carry on. Okay, on that, yes, uh, Kirsten measured. Uh, he, he mentioned you know the control being a, a ratio control, and and of course. Those ratio controls presume that, that those inputs, both of water quality and temperature and lime quality and all the things go around lime quality are consistent. And uh, so the important thing is the result of that consistency or lack of consistency will is manifested really as temperature. So temperature is an, is a, is a real, is an important part of um, of monitoring your slaking process because uh you know you, your your ratios can stay the same but your temperatures can start going and that'll be the first indication because you can't necessarily see it directly as as by taking a sort of scoop full of your of your milk of lime an experienced operator will be able to look at it look at the milk of lime coming out and sort of say hang on this is this is looking we we losing bulk density here and of course, things like the Marcy scale will will check those things. But temperature is important, and I, I would say from from our experience, you know, you want to sort of err on a slightly sort of you know towards eighty degrees rather than seventy degrees of of slaking temperature. Um, you know, lime slaking the rate of nucleation is strongly dependent on on temperature, so uh, you want to keep those things going. So control of your slaker. Um, make sure that your inputs are consistent and your temperature is is at the required range. Thank you very much, Simon. I think from my side is I'll repeat it again. Good lime, good quality water, and making sure you keep your lime uh, moving. You might be in the tank through agitation and right speed on the pipelines if you to avoid settlement. I think those are the key thing that personally I'm going to walk away uh, with. And then, yeah, uh, unfortunately, we're coming to an, to an end. And uh, like I said earlier, I wish we can go for another hour, but obviously yeah. it's not going to be possible. I mean, over to you and uh, and to our audience, just before I hand over to you, I mean, thank you very much for participating on the on the questions. I must say some uh, some great answers. And, and I think we all probably have learned from this discussion Kirsten Simon, thank you very much. I'll move over to you. Thank you, Prince. Maybe just before I go over my conclusion, there is some questions that came through in the chat from our guests. I just want to assure them that the questions are well noted and I will send the information or the answers to the question through post webinar. If there's anybody that would also want that information, please feel free to just leave your contact details in the chat and I can also include you and send you that, in, that information. Okay, perfect. So thank you everyone for joining us today for this informative and engaging webinar on the process of lime slurry production. In closing, we extend our heartfelt gratitude to our moderator, Prince Kangale, and our guest speakers, Simon and Carsten. Your insights have illuminated the intricate world of lime slurry production, covering crucial topics such as limestone buildup, factors influencing slaking, and effective grit removal. We are grateful for your expertise and for sharing that with us. Remember to schedule a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one of our guest speakers after the event. You can use the link that we've provided in the chat. And for those who couldn't join us live or wish to revisit the valuable discussion, fret not. The recording of this webinar will soon be available on our YouTube channel. So as we close off this enlightening webinar, we also thrilled to announce our next exciting event. Join us for an insightful exploration into the operation and maintenance of lime plants, where we'll delve into the challenges often faced in maintaining lime plants and key design points considered with maintenance kept in mind. So we will also discuss some of the key components that assist with maintenance challenges, 
Keep an eye on our social media channels for more information about this webinar. So thank you all for being part of this engaging session. We look forward to continuing our knowledge sharing journey. So until then, stay curious and stay connected until we meet again.